What's up guys? So today we are going to be talking about Isoate. More specifically, how to choose which class goes to which character. So there are uh, several factors to consider, but generally speaking, each class has certain traits that you're looking for from the characters that make them really well suited for each class. So that's what we're going to go over today. So let's get into it. All right, so we're talking about Isoate, specifically the classes, and I do just want to say this right before we jump into doing a class-by-class -class breakdown and what characters you're looking for for a specific class, um, and that is a couple things to note. The first is some characters are perfectly fine to be one class or another without any major trade-offs. So for example, I really like Mr. Sinister as a fortifier. However, if I were to run Mr. Sinister as a healer, there isn't one that is distinctly better or worse than the other. I can talk a little bit about why I like him as fortifier. Mainly he heals himself. So by having that barrier that they have to keep cutting through, it gives him more time to keep healing his health bar, but he does have active healing. He does have high health. And so having him as a healer also makes perfect sense. He is able to take full advantage of both classes. So it doesn't matter whether you have one or the other, you're not doing it wrong. So there are characters that fall into that category where it's not such a big deal. Also something to note is that uh, it's not necessarily as simple as what class should this character be? There may be a best class for a character, but you also have to look at the team composition. So if you don't have the right roles on your team, it may not make sense to make, you know, let's say you have three characters that all uh, are best as strikers. It may not make sense to have three strikers if the other two people on the team are not skirmishers. There is no one to put vulnerable uh, if they're not raiders either. If there is no vulnerable, then you're not getting good value out of your strikers. So someone should drop to raider or skirmisher for the benefit of the team functioning properly. So you do want to also consider team comp. But generally speaking, uh, there's some really easy traits to look for to help you identify which character should be which class. So that's what we're going to go over here. And then at the end of this video, people have a lot of questions about some of the intricacies about the order of operations, uh, what works with assist, what works with counter, what counts as active healing, all of that. How does uh, ice weight work with red star? So I am going to answer all of those interaction questions at the very end. And there'll be timestamps in the video description below for all of this. But let's jump into the classes. All right. So first, we're going to take a look at Raider. And if you see me looking down, it's because I have some notes on my phone. But so for Raider, uh, it will ultimately end up giving 20% max health if you go all the way to level five, which every single class will. And then it's also going to add in total 25% crit chance. And every character with a few exceptions, but for the most part, every character has 10% base crit chance. So it brings them up to 35% crit chance at max. And it's also going to add 10% crit damage. And most characters' base crit damage is 130%. This would bump it up to 140%. But what's important about Raider is that they apply vulnerable on any crit. Unlike the other classes that have a limited amount of vulnerable that they can apply, primarily just to the primary target, Raiders can apply mass vulnerable, which is very, very powerful. So there's two things you're looking for that will easily identify someone as a Raider. The first is any bonuses to crit. So someone like Killmonger, who's gonna have a really high crit chance. Someone like Deadpool, whose second attack is always gonna crit on minions, things like that. However, something that I think a lot of people have not been considering, the other thing that really easily identifies who should be a raider is someone who has a lot of splash damage and or AOEs, especially multi-hit AOEs. So some good examples for that are characters like Iron Man, Rocket, in particular, Crystal, she has, in addition to multiple AoEs, multi-hit. But basically, if the character has a 35% crit chance, some AoEs are coded so that either the ability crits on everyone or it crits on no one. And if it's coded that way, then one in three times that you press that AoE, you just cover everyone in vulnerable. Most AoEs in this game, however, are coded in a way that every individual target can be crit or not crit. So firing one AoE might get you two or three vulnerable. And on a multi-hit like the Crystal, I believe it's her special, that hits a bunch of times, you can get two and three stacks of vulnerable on each character if you get the right crits. Very, very powerful. So anyone who's doing constant AoE, a lot of AoE, a lot of splash damage, definitely you want Raider because you'll just be able to pump out a lot of vulnerables and that's increasing the damage you're dealing to the characters are hitting by 10%. So in a nutshell, that's Raider. 
So uh, here's a perfect example of Raider working really well with AoE. So this is right after I used a Killmonger ultimate and he had a slightly increased crit chance, but nothing too crazy. So with his melee chain, the first part of his ult, he crit on Hulk and he crit on Thanos. However, because he crit on at least one person with his melee chain, that prompted his bonus attack on his ultimate where he drops the landmine AOE, and that is an all or nothing crit, and he happened to get a crit on the landmine as well. So what you're seeing here is that with one Killmonger ultimate, five characters on the enemy team all got marked vulnerable, and two of them have two stacks of vulnerable because those were the two that originally got crit by the melee portion of it. So this is a perfect example of a character doing a lot of AOE or a lot of chaining, hitting a lot of targets, being able to put a ton of vulnerable on the field. All right, now we're taking a look at Skirmisher. So Skirmisher is gonna add 20% max health like all the others. And on primary hit, they are going to apply vulnerable. And if the target is already vulnerable and max, they're gonna clear two positive effects on primary hit. So uh, a quick note about Skirmisher is they have uh, an interesting interaction regarding their assists with Striker, so we'll also touch on this when we talk about Striker, but the short version is Skirmisher assists can apply vulnerable, especially if they are being called to assist a Striker. So the types of characters that you're looking for for Skirmisher are really high speed characters and characters that get called to assist frequently. So some good examples are Proxima Midnight, she's very fast, so she can go nice and early and put Vulnerable on a target, but also she will be called to assist on every Corvus basic. Another good example is Black Widow, again, very fast, and will get called to assist on any Hawkeye turn. And another really good example is Miss Marvel, because she's going to be getting called for a lot of assists. All right, so now we're taking a look at Healer. Uh, like the other classes, Healer is gonna give you 20% max health. It's also, when max, gonna give you 15% active healing. On turn, it'll apply a minor regeneration of the lowest health ally, and on turn, it'll heal the lowest health ally for 5% of this character's max health. So, to answer just a couple of questions while we happen to be here about healing and everything, minor regen, unlike vulnerable, which is in its own category and not really a debuff, minor regeneration is a normal buff. It's just a half strength regen, but it can be extended, it can be spread, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a weak regeneration at about half power. As for active healing, uh, I will go into the specifics of what does and doesn't constitute active healing at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. So for healers, you're mainly looking for two things. The big one is a large health pool, because a lot of what they're doing is giving out healing based on their health, right? Minor regen is based on their health, healing for a percentage of their health is based on their health, and then most heal abilities in the game are again based on the character's health, and of course healer is gonna give them additional max health as well. So you're mainly looking for characters with a large health pool. And then the other thing you're looking for is characters that have abilities that can take advantage of the increased active healing. And so again, at the end of the video, I will cover what does and doesn't constitute active healing, but just know that that's one of the other criteria. Characters that do really well as healers, um, characters like Shuri, large health bar, lots of healing. Minerva, large health bar, lots of healing. Uh, Mr. Sinister makes an excellent healer, so characters like that. All right, so now we're taking a look at Fortifier. So again, like all the other classes, you're gonna get 20% max health. On spawn, you're gonna end up getting 35,000 barrier, and then at max, you'll get 7% barrier on turn as well. So it's basically just receiving a lot of barrier. And so what you're looking for for Fortifier are characters with really high armor, and of course, characters with high health. And uh, characters that regen a lot or have a lot of natural healing also make good fortifiers. But yeah, the main one is high armor. The reason I say that is because you're getting a flat amount of extra barrier, and when a character attacks into you, armor is going to reduce the amount of damage they deal. And so a, a pool of barrier is worth more if it's being, if, if incoming damage is being reduced more with each attack that is coming in. So some of the characters that are just shoe-ins for excellent fortifiers are characters like Blob, The Thing, Rhino, any characters with really high health and really high armor make excellent fortifiers. And again, it may not be the optimal first choice, but characters that do a lot of self-healing, like Wolverine, like Captain Marvel, like X-23, any of those characters can also do very well as a fortifier because they'll be healing their health bar back while people are hitting into their barrier. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at Striker. 
So Striker is going to, in addition to giving the 20% max health like all the other classes, it is also going to give 15% base damage. And on primary hit, if the target is already vulnerable, they're going to do an ISO bonus attack. So uh, a couple things about that, but the, the first main note is the interaction with Skirmisher. Basically, unlike Skirmisher, Striker will only ever do their bonus attack on their own turn. It won't happen as a result of an assist or a counterattack or a passive proc or anything like that. However, if you reverse the situation and a striker goes first and calls an assist from a skirmisher, the striker will go, the skirmisher will go, then the vulnerable will get applied. Once the vulnerable is on, then the original striker who went first will do a bonus attack and consume the vulnerable that was just applied. So a striker that can call assists from one or several skirmishers will get many more bonus attacks. Otherwise though, the types of characters that you're looking for for striker, uh, you definitely are looking for characters with really high base damage. Characters like Black Bolt, Elsa Bloodstone, uh, etc. Anyone who has a really high damage stat is going to benefit tremendously from the 15% additional base damage. And then you're also looking at characters who call a lot of people to assist them. So a couple examples being Corvus Slave, who's always going to call Proxima to assist him, and Hawkeye, who's always going to call Black Widow to assist him. Um, those two being the, the higher base damage members in the pairs of those characters that call for assist. But all right, so now I just wanted to answer a lot of questions that have been coming up regarding the specifics behind some of the interactions with ISO-8. So in no particular order, just some random facts that I think might help people out and answer some questions that I've seen a lot of people asking. All right, so first and foremost, ISO-8 and its interaction with red stars as far as calculating a character's stats. The short version is ISO-8 does look at a character's base stats and their Stark tech, but it ignores red stars. And the opposite is also true. Red stars look at a character's base stats and their Stark tech, but it ignores ISO-8. Because they ignore each other, you can think of them as additive. And what I mean by that is if you're getting 75% more health from a seven red star, and you're getting 20% max health from your ISO-8, you can think of that as just 95% more max health because both of them are referencing base health plus Stark Tech and ignoring one another. All right, so now talking about active healing. So some things do constitute active healing and some things don't. The things that do not constitute active healing as far as healer ISO-8 are regens and health steal and health redistribution, which are kind of the same thing. But so health steal, you're looking at things like the Minerva Ultimate and the Ebony Maw Ultimate. And health redistribution, you're looking at things like the Phoenix Special and the Scarlet Witch Special. So while all of those things do involve healing as well as regen, none of them count as active healing. However, everything else does. Obviously, special abilities that use healing, like a Shield Medic Special, will definitely count. And then the other things that will count are drain and passive healing from passive abilities, things like Shuri passive and Minerva passive. All right, also going to include some questions coming from the Twitch chat regarding ISO-8. So we just got this one. At the start of ISO-8, how would you suggest the free-to-play community use their resources? So generally speaking, you always want to put as much power as you can into your arena team and your raid team, especially any characters that you use regularly for both. But those are the game modes where any and all gains you can make pay off arena obviously from power cores and raids because otherwise those are the best rewards in the game and it can save you from spending cores or other resources if you have to keep healing in raid so i would say it is a safe bet to make those characters especially the ones that appear in both as strong as possible that said i would also suggest starting by getting everyone to at least level one and then there are power spikes at iso 8 levels two and four uh, which I'll touch on in just a sec, but to get anyone to level one is very, very cheap. You literally only need one level one crystal of each to unlock their class, and then having a class is much better than not having a class. So uh, definitely any characters that you're using regularly in any game mode, it is not a big expenditure of resources to take them to level one. And then the sooner you can take them to level two, the better, because at level two, that's when every class gets 10% max health, and then later down the road at level four, that's another 10% max health. Definitely try to give as many characters as you can at least level one, save all of the big upgrades for characters you're using in Arena and Raid, and then uh, as you're able to, try to just get characters to level two for the big spike in health. 
All right, another question that we just got, is spending 5,000 in the ISO stores a good value? So much like with a lot of the stuff you can buy in a lot of the stores in this game, the newer you are to that store and what's in it, the more value there is in spending the currency on it. So being that right now, as far as I know, no one has enough ISO 8 to cover all of their characters, spending a few ions to be able to grab some additional crystals is going to potentially allow you to get someone to a class sooner, and the more people that you can assign a class, the better off you will be. So it is worth buying for now. However, the rate at which we get ions versus the cost of those, 5,000 ions, uh, while that's not a huge amount, um, it's also not worth it for a single level one ISO crystal down the road. It will become a bad value. Yeah, as as you, if you still have a lot of characters that don't have a class, I would be fine saying, yeah, you should probably continue buying the ice weight that appears in the store. As soon as most of your characters have a class, uh, you should probably stop. So I also do want to mention what kinds of things can proc a vulnerable from a character who is a skirmisher. And uh, it's actually kind of surprising, but so what does and doesn't constitute a primary hit? Anything that targets and affects an enemy, even if it's just a debuff, does count as a primary hit. So for example, if you have Ebony Maw as a skirmisher and use his special, which just applies offense down to the enemies and that's it, the primary target of that will get vulnerable because they were targeted by something. However, if you compare that to say a Kingpin ultimate where he's just giving buffs to his own team because nothing was done to the enemy team, in that instance, no vulnerable. Uh, also, just to clear up some of the confusion on counters and assists and applying vulnerable. So uh, for the most part, assists do function like they're supposed to. Skirmisher assisting on a target, they will either apply vulnerable or if the target is already vulnerable, they will remove buffs. However, this is not the case for counter attacks. Counter attacks will do none of the above. Uh, and that is true of both types of counter attacks because there are counter attacks that actually use a character's counter attack ability tied to their basic. Characters like Blob, who is going to counter attack with his passive, and it is his, his usual counterattack tied to his basic, and then there's also characters like Call Obsidian and Colossus, who have what what functions like a counterattack, but it's actually a retaliation attack, which has its own damage stats tied to their passive, uh, but again, neither of those will have any interaction with vulnerable, they, they don't count as proper attacks. I also did want to mention this feature, if you haven't seen it yet, the devs did include the ability to lock isolate classes for war defense. So you will be able to, even if you lock their classes for war defense, you'll be able to then use these characters in other game modes and change up their classes as needed while making sure that the classes that you want on defense are what's gonna stick. All right, so hopefully that answered all of your questions about ISO 8. If you have any other questions that I didn't cover in this video, please leave them in the comments below and I'll make sure to cover that in a future video. But otherwise, that's what I've got for you. So I did wanna mention, anyone is welcome to join my Discord server, discord.gg slash casino. We got blitz predictions, infographics, videos, data mines, content creator Q&A, and more. And of course, daily Twitch streams are back every single day at 1 p.m. Pacific time over at twitch.tv slash casino. But as I said, that's all I've got for you right now. I will have another video out for you guys really soon. But until then, peace.